Welcome friends. Today's topic in the Viva House of Anatomy is a humorous one. The another name of the humorous is a funny one. Now it is a example of the typical long one. And as it is a typical long one, it is having an upper end, lower end, and intervening sub. First we will see the side determination of the humorous. Its upper end is globular and contains the rounded head, whereas the lower end is flattened entero posteriorly so it is expanded from the side to side the second point the head rounded head is facing medially the third point the upper end contain the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle in which this lesser tubercle is facing anteriorly from its upper end so the given bone in my hand is of a left side next part is the feature and the attachment of the humerus now the humerus is divided into three parts, upper end, shaft and lower end. We will see one by one. First, we will be talking about the upper end. The upper end, the parts of the upper end, the first part, the head. The head is rounded and it will form the one third of the sphere. The head will articulate with the glenoid cavity of the scapula to form the glenohumeral joint or the solar joint, which is a ball and socket type of the synovial. Now the second part in the upper end, anatomical nail. The rim of the head is known as an anatomical nail. Now this anatomical nail provides attachment of a capsular ligament of the solar joint except superiorly and medially. The third part, the surgical nail. Surgical nail is the junction between the upper end and the shaft. The most important uh, point of the surgical aid is that it is related to the posterior circumflex humeral vessels and axillary nerve. The third part, fourth part in the upper end, morphological neck. Now the morphological neck lies 0.5 mm uh, centimeter above the surgical neck and it will mark the junction between the upper epiphysis and the diaphysis of a humerus. The next part in the upper end is a laser tubercle. Laser tubercle is a small prominent area facing anteriorly from the upper end of the humerus. It will provide attachment of a subscapularis muscle. Next part is a greater tubercle. Greater tubercle will form the lateral part of a upper end. Now the posterior lateral part of a greater tubercle, it will mark by the three impression, upper, middle and the lower. Now these three impression provide the insertion of the three muscles that is from above downward, supraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor. You can remember the mnemonic C, S, I, T. The next part is a sulcus that is intertubercular sulcus Sul sulcus between the, these two list, uh, tub tubercles that is also known as a bicipital groove now the bicipital groove below it is marked by on the either side the medial lip and the lateral lip which are the nothing but the downward continuation of a lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle respectively this intertubercular sulcus is breached by the transverse humerus ligament and it lodges the long head of biceps brachii muscle along with its synovial seat and the ascending branch of anterior circumflex humeral artery. Now, the attachment related to the bicipital group, its floor receives insertion of a latissimus dorsi muscles, the medial border receives the insertion of a teres major muscle and the lateral border receives the insertion or insertion of pectoralis major muscle so you can remember the mnemonic the larry between two major larry means the latissimus dorsi in the middle part in the floor and two major the teres major being medially and pectoralis major being laterally the second part of the humerus is a shaft now the shaft is cylindrical in the upper part and the triangular in the lower part. Roughly overall we will assume it is triangular in the shape. So it is having three border and three surface. First we will talk about the border. The three border are first 
anterior border, second medial border and third lateral border. We will see one by one. The anterior border extending from the lateral leaf of the bicipital groove above in the middle it will form the anterior margin of a deltoid tuberosity and in the lower part it is rounded and ends just above the radial fossa. The second medial border. Medial border is prominent in the lower part where it forms the medial supracondylar ridge. In the middle part it is marked by the rough strip and in the upper part it will form the medial leaf of a bicipital groove. Now this rough strip in the middle of a medial border receives the insertion of a coricobrachialis muscle. The third border is a lateral border. Again it is very well demarcated in the lower part where it forms the lateral supracondylar ridge. In the middle part it is interrupted by the spiral groove or the radial groove and in the upper part it will traceable up to the posterior part of the greater tubercle. So these are the three borders. Now we will see the three surfaces. Three surfaces. The first one is an anteromedial surface, the surface that lies between the medial border and the anterior border. The second surface is an anterolateral surface, the surface lies between the anterior border and lateral border. Now, the, these two surfaces, anteromedial as well as anterolateral, in the lower part here, it will give the origin of a brachialis muscle. Now, in the anterolateral surface, in its somewhere middle part, it is marked by the rough V-shaped tuberosity which is known as a deltoid tuberosity. Now this deltoid tuberosity receives the insertion of a deltoid muscle. Just behind the deltoid tuberosity, this surface is traversed by the deltoid, uh, sorry, radial groove or the spiral groove which lodges the profunda brachii vessels and the radial nerve. The last surface is a posterior surface that is lies between the medial border and the lateral border. Now the posterior surface in its upper part is marked by the oblique ridge which gives the origin to the lateral head of the triceps brachii muscle and the lower part of the posterior surface gives the origin of a medial head of the tricep brachii muscle. The last part in the humerus is its lower end. The lower end is expanded from the side to side. It is having two parts, the articular part and the non-articular non part. First, we will talk about the articular part. The, in the articular part, first, it is having the small rounded part, which is, which is known as a capitulum or the little head. Now, this articular part will articulate with the head, superior surface of the head of the radius. The second articular part is a pulley shaped trochlea which lies just medial to the capitula. Now this pulley shaped trochlea will articulate with the trochlear nodes of a ulna. Now this uh, in the trochlea its medial end is 6 mm downwards than its lateral end and this uh, formation is responsible for the formation of a carrying angle which is 163 degree. Now we will talking about the non-articular part. The first radial fossa. Radial fossa is a small depression that lies above the capitulum anteriorly. Now this radial fossa will accommodate the head of the radius in the full flexion of the elbow joint. The second is a coronoid fossa that lies just above the trochlea anteriorly. Now this coronoid uh, fossa <coughs> will articulate with the coronoid process of the ulna in the full flexion of the elbow joint. The third non-articular part is a polygronal fossa that lies posteriorly and it will articulate with the deep of the polygronal process of the ulna during the full extension of an elbow joint. The fourth part, medial epicondyle. The medial epicondyle is a prominent area in the medial part of a lower end. Same 
literally there is a literal epicondyle but it is less prominent the sixth median supracondylar ridge it is a uh, sharp ridge that lies just above the medial epicondyle of the humerus same way literally there is a literal supracondylar ridge now we will see the attachment related to the lower end the capsular ligament of the elbow joint is attached above the mar margin of a radial fossa, coronoid fossa anteriorly, polygronal fossa posteriorly and it will leave the medial and the lateral epicondyle outside. Means it will attach along the margin of the capitulum as well as trochlea. Now the attachment on the medial epicondyle. The medial epicondyle gives origin to the superficial flexure muscle of the forearm. So that point is known as a common flexor origin. The lateral epicondyle gives origin to the superficial extensor muscle of the forearm that is known as a common extensor origin. Additionally, the lateral epicondyle gives origin to the anconeous muscle from its posterior part. Now next medial supracondylar ridge in its lower part just above the medial epicondyle it will use the origin of humeral head of pronated teres muscle now next last lateral supracondylar ridge from its upper two third part it will give origin to the brachioradialis and from its lower one third it will give origin to the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle so this is about now the applied anatomy of the humerus. The first one, the common site of the fracture in the humerus are the surgical knee, the sac, and the supracondylar region. Now, when the fracture in the supracondylar region occurs, it may compress the brachial artery which passes in front of the elbow joint. So the compression of the brachial artery will diminish the arterial supply of the muscle of a forearm and it will lead to the Walkman's ischemic contracture. Now, when the fracture occurs, what will happen? First, we will see the normal anatomy. In the full flexion of the elbow joint, these two epicondyle, medial and the lateral, and the teeth of an olecronal process will form the triangular area in the flexion of the elbow. When the elbow is extended, this three line, three point li lies in the one line. So when the fracture of the supracondylar region of the humerus occurs, this, uh, uh, this uh, arrangement will be disrupted. The third part, the humerus is commonly dislocated uh, inferiorly. Now at the end we will see the credit question of this bone. The first credit question. Which are the three nerves which is directly related to the humerus? The first is the axillary nerve around the surgical nerve of the humerus. Second, the radial nerve that is in the spiral groove or the radial fossa. The third is a median or ulnar nerve that is uh, behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. The second question: the content of the bicipital groove. These are the long head of the biceps brachii muscle along with its synovial sheath. Ascending branch of the anterior circumflex humeral artery. The third critical question: Why the carrying angle is formed? The carrying angle is formed because the trochlea of the humerus, its medial flange or the medial edge, is six millimeter downwards than its lateral edge, and this will uh, responsible for the formation of the carrying angle. So when the elbow is flexed. The humerus and the ulna comes to lies in the same plane. When the elbow is being extended because of this medial flange which is 6 mm downwards, the forearm will get deviated and it will form an angle outside which is 163 degree. The importance of the carrying angle is that it will prevent the rubbing of your forearm against the trunk while we are walking. This is all about the humerus. Now the more videos related to the anatomy, you can subscribe our channel Viva Boss of Anatomy and for the regular update, you can click on the bell icon.